my name is Matt Lacerdo. I am the director here at Northeastern's Alumni Office of the Affinity and Domestic Programming. Um, this program is actually in a partnership with our DC alumni volunteers. Uh, so we're very excited uh, for them to kind of help host this event. Unfortunately, our DC alum uh, is stuck in a meeting, so he'll be joining us shortly, but we want to make sure we can get this going. Um, just from quick housekeeping uh, things, uh, we do ask people if you can keep your cameras off, uh, that'd be great. It just helps with the connection just because we do have a large amount of people that are gonna be joining. Uh, if you have any questions, um, feel free to add them to the chat. Um, and with that, it actually looks like Nick is here. So I'm gonna pass it over to Nick from the DC community to kind of fully introduce the presentation. So thank you so much and Nick, take it over. I have to be able to unmute Nick. Hold on one second. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. And hi, everyone. I want to welcome all my fellow Northeastern alumni, students, and friends. Uh, I'm Nick Beek, one of the two volunteer co-leaders for the Washington, D.C. Northeastern community. We are very excited to be able to host this event for everyone today. It looks like we have an excellent turnout. I want to take a quick moment and thank you for joining us. We are always looking for new ideas uh, for programs for our events, and this event came from a suggestion from one of our community members. I also want to take a, take a quick moment to thank uh, all the staff who obviously put a ton of time into this event. I know we all want to hear from the professor, so let's get the program going. And uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Tina Elasi Rod in advance, and please feel free to take it over from here. Great. Thank you very much, Nick and Matt. Uh, and let me share my screen. I believe you can see my screen. Is that correct? Excellent. So um, let's uh, get started. My name is Tina Yassi Rod. I'm a professor of computer science and network science at Northeastern University. Uh, my background is in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, as way of where I have been, I was educated in the Midwest. I studied at the University of Wisconsin and the University of Illinois. My uh, PhD in computer science with a minor in mathematical statistics is from Wisconsin. I interned at Hewlett Packard and at Hughes Research Laboratory in beautiful Malibu, California. And then after a nine year stint at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, which is a national nuclear security laboratory, uh, I joined academia in the East Coast. I was a professor at Rutgers University in central New Jersey before I moved up to Boston to join Northeastern University. In terms of what I have uh, worked on, I've been around for a while. I studied in approximation algorithms, core computer science kind of work, uh, then programming languages for my dissertation. I worked on one of the first personalized web searches. Um, then when I joined Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, I was working on scientific simulation data. So here, think about supernova, um, think about modeling um, stars exploding, basically. Then uh, after 9-11, there was a lot of funding in the government in terms of if we could have only connected the dots. And so I transitioned to working on social networks and graph um, data structures. And that led me to work on network science and computational social science. Computational social science is where you have a social science question and you're trying to address it with computational methods. And that led me to machine learning and ethics and also recently working on complex systems and the democratic backsliding that we have observed here and elsewhere. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you only about machine learning and ethics. Um, the boxes that are highlighted are active projects in my group. Uh, and again, as I said, I'm only going to look at machine learning and ethics today. So this is the outline of my presentation. I'll give you a little background on machine learning. Then I'll talk about some impossibility results. Then I'll go to some new work that we have called the RawlsNet, uh, named after John Rawls, the famous uh, political philosopher. And uh, we'll conclude then. So the phrase machine learning has been around for a long time. Uh, Arthur Samuel, which was a noted engineer and scientist, coined it way back in 1959. And he referred to it as a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And what you're actually seeing is a Samuel uh, Checker's playing program, which was the very first machine learning program 
Um, and it wasn't learning the way we think of machine learning these days. It was basically memorizing uh, every state of the game with the terminal reward of having been in that state. So machine learning has been around for a long time, even though now you know it's a buzz, uh, buzz a phrase and you hear it all the time. When it was first um, introduced, um, it was supposed to be this beautiful interdisciplinary field uh, where uh, computer science would come together with philosophy, economics, evolutionary biology, neuroscience, et cetera, et cetera. And if I have missed your field, my apologies, I didn't want the flower to get to um too crowded but in practice uh what happens is the following uh where a says to b this is your machine learning system b says yep you pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra then collect the answers on the other side a says what if the answers are wrong and b says just stir the pile until they start looking right so this is a somewhat cynical perspective um, but there is a kernel of truth there in that the words right and wrong here just refer to accuracy. Um, they have no moral status. They have no normative status of what ought to be done. And in particular, when you look at a machine learning system, its elements are obviously data. Then this model, this mathematical or statistical model in terms of how you're gonna represent the data then your model is going to have parameters or weights that you need to learn. So you're going to have some loss function about how well your model is learning the world. And then to learn those weights or parameters, you need an optimization algorithm. Now, in this machine learning system, there's something missing. And what is missing is the actual task definition. Who decides what task it is that you're trying to solve? And in most cases, the task is coming from these companies. Uh, most of them care about recommendation or personalization, um, ad targeting. Um, but what has happened, uh, especially in uh, recent years, has been that data is being collected and is being used for what we refer to as high stakes situations, life altering cases, where data is being used in terms of policing or criminal justice or credit reporting, school assignments, um, social welfare assessment, uh, hiring. And um, this is not just, oh, now you're seeing an ad that you don't want to see. Um, it's more severe. And even in terms of ads, um, there's the famous case of Latanya Sweeney, who's a very famous professor at Harvard, who was trying to show a journalist one of uh, her papers, and she searched it on Google. And the ads that came on the side were about whether she was arrested or whether um, there was a bail on her or, or something like that. And they figured out that what was happening was because Latanya is a first name that is often given to, to African-American uh, babies and not uh, to, uh, to white babies. Um, so if she had typed into Google um, Tanya Sweeney, um, the ads are ancestry.com, stuff like that. But Latanya Sweeney, um, you get ads about bail bonds and so on and so forth. So even those kinds of ads can have um, this kind of life altering um, uh, aspects to them because as an employer, you're gonna do a Google search on uh, the, the perspective. Uh, and if Google says arrested question mark, you think, well, Google knows something. Um, and these are all about um, the social biases that creep into the algorithms. Now, what I want to do is slow down a little bit and talk about a, um, how, how should we think about these problems? So um, Tom Mitchell, who's a very famous uh, machine learning AI professor at Carnegie Mellon University, wrote a book way back in 1997, where he defined the well-posed learning problem as a triple. So you have a task, you have experience, and you have a performance measure. And he defined uh, the well-posed uh, learning problem as a computer program that is set to learn from this experience, this data, with respect to a certain task that you give it. And then, of course, there's some performance measure that you're judging the program on. A simple instance of a well-posed learning problem is your spam filter for your email, right? The task is for the spam filter to separate the email that's coming to you into spam and not. 
um, the experience that it's getting, among other things, is you actually moving email into your junk folder. And the performance measure is, for example, accuracy or like what fraction of um, the emails that were spam did um, the filter actually um, mark as spam. Now, when you think about algorithms being used right now on um, in our society, uh, there are two very popular tasks. Uh, one is risk assessment and the other one is ranking. And you may say, uh, why these two tasks? And one of the reasons is because machine learning people know a lot about them. These tasks are, um, to use a phrase from George W. Bush's era, low hanging fruit. Um, in fact, assessing risk is really just sorting. And computer scientists um, know a lot about sorting. So I'm going to sort people into high risk versus low risk, basically. And the other aspect of it is the flip side of it is that the human decision makers also really like the output of these tasks. So if I come and tell you that Jack's ri risk of defaulting on a loan is eight and Jill's is two, uh, and with eight being higher, then you're like, okay, I'm going to give the loan to Jill, right? Or if I come to you and say Ed's risk of, of recidivism is nine and Peter's is one, you're like, okay, I won't let Peter out. I, I, I won't let Ed out, but Peter can get bail, right? It's a very easy understanding. And this is actually um, where in some states, um, tools like this in terms of risk assessment for pretrial disposition are in fact being used and affecting um, judges' decisions. Um, or for example, if I give you a risk assessment tool about pneumonia, for example. Now, there are lots of um, issues with these current tasks. Um, the first one is mission impossible. So what happens is when you're trying to do machine learning, you have to somehow evaluate how this machine learning algorithm is doing right, that performance measure P that Tom Mitchell was talking about. And oftentimes what we rely on is this thing called the confusion matrix or the error matrix, where for example, it would say, well, did you indeed have that condition? And did my algorithm predict you having that condition, right? So if we are, for example, predicting cancer, do you have cancer? And did my machine learning model predict that you have cancer? And so that's known as true positive, or if you didn't have cancer and my machine learning algorithm predicted that you have cancer, that's false positive and so on and so forth. Now, what has happened is you take um, this simple counting, right? In terms of how many of the true positives that I get right, how many of the true negatives that I get right, how many of the true positives that I get wrong, how many of the true negatives that I get wrong, and you develop these into these measures that are very common in machine learning, like accuracy or recall or precision. And what has happened in, in terms of people who are working on fair machine learning or algorithmic bias, they say, oh, okay, well, for um, my blacks and for my whites, what I want to do is I want to have the same accuracy or I want to have the same false positive rate or so on and so forth. And what has happened is that you can't have certain conditions of fairness or parity as they called all at the same time. So let me give you some examples to make this more clear. So back in 2016, Cholokova published a paper that said, suppose I can divide my population into two mutually exclusive groups. So suppose I have my females and I have my non-females. And suppose the condition that I'm interested in has unequal base rates. That is, for example, the probability of my females getting breast cancer is different than the probability of my males getting breast cancer. This seems very reasonable, right? So then she said, suppose that I put this condition that my um, classifier is gonna have the same probability, my machine learning model, also known as classifier, is gonna have the same probability of saying somebody has breast cancer, regardless of whether they're female or non-female. And what Cholokova showed was that you cannot have a certain um, fairness measures that you want all at the same time. For example, she showed that you cannot have predictive parity, true positive parity and false positive parity all at the same time. And I'll get to what these mean in a minute. 
um, and um, what computer scientists have done in terms of addressing these. Um, then Kleinberg also in 2016 said, well, okay, suppose I have my females and my non-females. And again, suppose that I have unequal base rates in terms of who gets breast cancer in my society. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove this condition that my classifier is going to have the same probability of predicting that somebody has breast cancer, whether they're female or not female. But I'll put in these conditions of that I will not have a perfect machine learning model and that I'm going to have this condition of non-zero precision. And again, he showed that you, you're not going to have these parity conditions. And again, these parity conditions are important because there was a very famous study that was done and published by ProPublica about a software um, called um, Compass and its, and its data that showed that that company, that was a private company, was using the software in um, bail situations. And they were like, oh, well, we have predictive parity. That is the probability of my, uh, of uh, the person, um, for example, being a flight risk, given that my classifier is saying um, he's a, 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 he has a flight risk, is the same whether it's, um, it's black or white. Um, and then later on, we showed uh, that you don't even need to have this mutual exclusivity. That is, you could have uh, people who are female and non-female, uh, depending on how you, you um, demarcate who's a female, and you're still going to have the same problems. And so, um, again, when you think about impossibility results, it means that you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't satisfy all of these conditions that you would like to be satisfied all at the same time. And there are other um, um, problems as well that we show in recent work where you can get rid of some more conditions and you're still going to have um, this, pro this problem. And there are lots of other impossibilities as well. Like, for example, if you care about negative predictive parity, or if you care about treatment equality, that you're treating people from the two groups the same way, you're still going to have these problems. And if you are um, a Mathematica uh, fanatic, you can download um, the code and play with it and see other impossibility results. So what has happened here with these impossibility results that were used all the time, even in software um, that you know, uh, were used in different states? Um, so the solution that computer scientists came up with was, well, OK, you know what? If I can't have all three of them, I'll get rid of one of them. Or, or I'll put some bounds on um, how far off I'm going to be. Um, again, the culture in computer science is that you're going to solve the problem however way you need to. Um, and so uh, from the law side, uh, Deborah Hellman, who is a professor of law at University of Virginia, has been looking into what these different parity measures actually mean. And so predictive parity, uh, which, for example, that company North Point really cared about, was what you ought to believe. And true positive and false positive parities capture what you ought to do. Now, if you have an algorithm right now and you're thinking about predictive parity in terms of what you ought to do, um, then your algorithm is going to look for what's called the right making properties. And the right making properties in our society is being a white male. And so this favors the white male category to, um, um, to the disadvantage of everybody else. And so in uh, work that she has done, which I really like, she says, okay, well, hey, computer scientists, if you say I can have all three of them and you wanna get rid of one of them, the thing to get rid of would be predictive parity, which for example, in the North Point software, um, uh, which was Compass, um, they were actually just banking on predictive parity. Now there are lots of other issues. For example, um, these software basically are like the old uh, gladiator times. It's in fact, it's just thumbs up or thumbs down. Some of them give you scale, but none of them give you any uncertainty that this model may have. Um, and in fact, going back to this um, story that I've referenced a couple of times, this came out in 2016 by ProPublica called Machine Bias. There is a uh, paragraph there that talks about this guy, Paul Zilli in Wisconsin, where the mutual lawyers had come up with a plea deal, but when the judge saw Zilli's score by um, this company, North Point's software, which is private, nobody could see in it. Later on, people tried to re-engineer what that was doing, what the software was doing. The judge is like, 
no, the score is as bad as I could get. And he, over, he threw out the plea deal, which to me is just nuts, right? Because it's not like um, this software uh, has 100% certainty. So in a way, the judge, it seems that it's treating the software as an expert witness uh, without actually um, um, questioning it. Um, I see a white, um, a blue line on my screen. I don't know if somebody did an annotate or something. Um, I'm not sure if I can um, get rid of it. Um, let's see. Yeah, they're drawing. So um, there are other issues with the current task. I said there's no uncertainty values, which is just nuts, right? Which is like these human decision makers seem to be using um, these software as expert witnesses without questioning them. The other one is that uh, the software does not provide any kind of context. Obviously, if I get 30 years worth of data from Massachusetts about uh, pretrial disposition, I'm going to learn a different model than I get 30 years worth of data from, let's say, Florida. And so um, as the task is defined now, you get no context. And so we have done uh, other work where you, we can, it's very easy to be able to place somebody in a bigger context and also provide uh, uncertainty values. Um, the last uh, two is uh, that um, the, the last two issues with the current task of risk assessment in particular are that um, the, they're not considering the incentives of the human decision maker. Um, and also they are not considering how the human judges the machine and the outcome of the machine. So we should care about why the human is using this software. Is the human using this software, for example, North Point software for efficiency purposes? Are people using them for profits? Are they using them for accuracy? Are they using them for interpretability? What are the incentives? In fact, there's a game theoretic model in here that is not being taken into account. In terms of the um, last issue, in terms of how humans judge machines, my friend Cesar Hidalgo has a really nice new book out uh, and uh, the preprint is uh, available online. So if you go to um, this uh, URL, judgingmachines.com, you can read it, uh, where from the psychology side, he um, did these human crowdsourcing experiments to figure out whether um, how humans judge the outcome of humans versus how humans judge the outcomes of machines. And um, he found two um, um, prominent patterns. One is that people judge humans by their intentions and machines by their outcomes, um, which is interesting because the machine is built by a human. Whether it's a software or hardware, the machine is built by human. And it seems that the intention of the human that built the machine does not transfer uh, from the machine to the outcome of the machine. And uh, people assign extreme intentions to the human, but very narrow intentions to the machine, um, which is also very interesting. Uh, and so these are things that we need to think about if uh, an algorithm, if software, if a machine is gonna be used, especially in these high, uh, high stakes um, decisions. Now, one place that um, machine learning can be used uh, is in figuring out whether policies are being enacted correctly. In particular, think about, for example, stop and frisk in New York City. Clearly, the policymakers for that policy um, didn't say that the intent of stop and frisk is to stop and harass uh, young people of color. But if you see the data, from the execution of that policy, you see that it seems like the intent was to harass um, young uh, people of color. And so then you can either change the execution of the policy or change the policy and um, um, have a, a good effect on our society. So on that, I'm gonna transition to RawlsNet, which actually talks more about policy and how we can use data and algorithms for uh, figuring out better policies for our society. And that's where we uh, um, talk about John Rawls and his principle of fair equality of opportunity. Uh, fair equality of opportunity uh, is about fair allocation of advantageous uh, social positions 
Um, so for example, high paying jobs, uh, so on and so forth. And one of the good things about this fair equality of opportunity is that it can be formalized as conditional independence. And in particular, it just says that the outcome, the probability of you being able to get an advantageous position in society should be independent of your protected attributes, race, gender, social economic status, given your talent. Um, and so, as we know, like those kinds of uh, protected attributes should not play a role in whether you get an advantageous position or not. And so this can be represented uh, with a model called Bayesian networks. And so we looked at this problem of given an unfair outcome in the sense that Rawlsnet talks about it in terms of this fair equality of opportunity, uh, can we alter the parameters of the model that we are learning to be able to satisfy this fair equality of opportunity? And of course the answer was yes, we have the system that can alter the parameters of the Bayesian network, not its structure to be able to satisfy this fair equality of opportunity. And in particular, like you give us your data, we will learn this Bayesian network structure, then we will determine whether your application is relevant to fair equality of opportunity. And then we try to change the parameters of this Bayesian network to be able to satisfy FEO. And in cases you cannot satisfy FEO, how close can we get to it? And so a classic case of fair equality of opportunity is you, have, you want a job, right? And so whether you get that job or not, oftentimes is dependent on your social economic status and on the college that you went to. So this is the, the structure of the Bayesian network that you have and where Rawlsnet has an impact is at the college level, not at the job level. That is for college admissions, what can I do so that the population that goes out looking for jobs uh, would be uh, the right, um, would have the right composition. And so, for example, in experiments that we have ran, so you're born, uh, you take a test, you enter college, you get a job. I know obviously this is very uh, simplified version of a life. Uh, without doing any changes, if you look at data, you see that, for example, obviously if you have a high socioeconomic status and you're talented, then the probability of getting a job is very high. Uh, but what we see is that if you have high socioeconomic status and uh, not high talent, uh, your probability of getting a job is higher than if you are talented. And so when we change um, um, the parameters of this um, Bayesian network, then we're able to show that uh, the probability of getting a job is actually satisfying um, John Rawls's fairy called opportunity. That is the probability of getting a job uh, is the same whether you're talented or whether you're talented and you come from a high social economic status. And um, the same for the probability of getting a job when you just come from high social economic status and don't have talent or, or you have neither. And of course, as I said, there are conditions in which you cannot satisfy uh, all the conditions and constraints. Uh, for example, a particular college can only take in so many students, right? but we can still change the parameters of the model to get it close to FEO, where the, uh, the differences um, in terms of uh, talented and the probability of getting a job versus uh, talented and, and socioeconomically high are closer to each other. Now, one of the things that one has to watch out for is that when you put out a system uh, like um, our system Rawlsnet, to be very careful about what are its uses. So one of the uses for us, and this is a work um, as a tier one project at, at Northeastern uh, with Dan Jackson, uh, Yakov uh, Bart and Debbie Ramirez um, is about what if I generate, I can generate aspirational data, right? If I can generate aspirational data that is synthetic data that can model fair circumstances, then I can see what pitfalls there are just in my machine learning algorithm because a lot of attention has been paid in the data is bad. And of course the data is bad, uh, right? The data is rife with our social problems, but that's not where the story ends. And so that's one of them that you can use a system like Rawlsnet to generate fair data that satisfies FEO. The other one is that you can use it to aid policymakers in their decision-making. For example, if you're thinking about college admission committee, what you can do is you can talk to them about their applicant pool 
you can uh, see if they have some notion of a distribution of talent and you can use that to give them um, advice in terms of uh, percentages of, of uh, what's the probability of admitting somebody with this certain kind of background. Now, we are working also on the case of what if um, data are fair, but the model isn't. And as I was foreshadowing a minute ago, um, if your data is fair and aspirational, uh, you still have to worry about your model. That is, if you just maximize for what's the probability of me having seen this data, like maximum likelihood estimate, you will still, uh, you could still get a model that is not fair. Um, and so, and we, uh, this is uh, work that we're writing right now, that there are lots of other issues with a machine learning model that you have to worry about, even if your data is coming from a perfect world, that you have somehow composed this perfect world and you're getting perfect data, um, non-biased data, um, right? Uh, which is by non-biased, I mean non-socially biased. Obviously you need some statistical biases. Um, and you, you can't just say my data is fair, so I'm fine. And in fact, I like this picture from uh, Jennifer Wortman Vaughn from Microsoft Research, where she sh shows the typical uh, machine learning life cycle. And unfairness can come in to any aspect of this. So from uh, the task definition, who designs the task, uh, to the data set construction, to how, what model are you using? Uh, what is its definition? This is where, for example, somebody like Helen Nissenbaum since the mid 1990s has been talking about how you need to put value in terms of your model definition, in terms of your task definition. Then there's the whole training process. What optimization algorithm are you using? The testing process, deployment, who are you deploying it on, right? Um, and then feedback. So in the entire process, you can have unfairness creep in and you should be aware of it. Um, so I quickly went through um, just a brief background on machine learning. What are some of the very popular tasks that people are using when they're talking about fair machine learning or algorithmic decision-making? And most of them are risk assessment. I talked about some of the problems with risk assessment in terms of uh, of the of the impossibility results, um, I'm gonna take care of that drawing there, um, and then uh, also in terms of where machine learning can be used is um, to see either a policy isn't being executed correctly as uh, it was intended to, or uh, give guidance to policymakers, and that the story doesn't end uh, with the data. And so what are some of the, um, oops, I lost my mouse, sorry, oops. I hope my mouse comes back, here we go. So what are some of the take home messages? So one is that um, because um, unfairness can appear anywhere in this machine learning um, life cycle, you should care about normativity, what you ought to do, right? Throughout the entire process whether you think about it in terms of the machine learning um, life cycle or whether you think about it in terms of the well-posed learning problem of the task, the experience and the performance measure. We really need to consider the incentives and the values of the expert human decision maker that is using these automated techniques. And if somebody comes to you and says, oh, I have a system that's more accurate than a human, you should be suspicious about that. Um, how accurate, how was it measured, on what things was it measured? In fact, this is where there are two groups of people uh, and they have the same idea where perhaps automated techniques should have warning labels or nutrition labels, right? I personally like the warning labels where you would say this algorithm may perform poorly on people of color. It was not tested on people of color. We don't know how it will work on people of color. The same way with drugs, we do that, right? Um, and so some kind of a FDA basically for algorithms, especially if they're being used in, um, in high stakes decision. And then as a society, we need to have serious discussions about when, where, for what, and how we should use machine learning. Um, so for example, maybe we shouldn't use machine learning to decide if somebody's dangerous 
in, in the bail situation because that is so rife with our social biases. And then what can we do? So one is educate the public, right? The public needs to know that these algorithms are being used. Um, diversify the teams that are building this technology, that lived experience really matters. Uh, incorporate design, uh, incorporate values and design. This is um, again, going back to Helen Nissenbaum from the mid 1990s. Have these warning labels, or if you like nutrition labels on every aspect of your machine learning life cycle. Um, don't say that my algorithm will work on anyone. Um, perhaps hold technologists legally and financially accountable, right? So right now, if my algorithm uh, causes harm to somebody, um, nothing happens to me, right? Um, so should we think about it in the legal term? And then also change the uh, culture of uh, among the technologists. So just because you can build it doesn't mean that you should build it. Um, and if you're interested in this more, we have a recent nature paper that's going to come out in the next week or two, um, which talks about measuring um, algorithmically infused societies. And so you can uh, you can look at it there. And I want to end uh, with the following um, two slides. One is uh, by, by Sophia Noble, who wrote the book Algorithms of Oppression. And she says, you have no business designing technology for society when you know nothing about society. And that is absolutely true, right? <laughs> um, and which leads to um, this issue of um, if you're just going to have, for example, an ethics committee on the side, um, your, your technology team is doomed to fail, right? So you really need to start from the very beginning, um, studying what you're trying to propose for society that you're saying my technology is going to make the society better or it's going to be more profitable for me and how that affects the society and actually learning about, uh, about the context that your algorithm is going to be used. And I know that in some cases that's not possible, but still, you at least need to try. Right now, there's nothing being done there. And then lastly, I wanted to finish with this question, which is, um, as a technologist, uh, I would imagine that there are lots of you in the audience, would you want your technology to be used on you or your loved ones, especially for these high stakes decisions? Uh, and when I ask this question at my technical conferences, nobody raises their hand, nobody we should tell you something about what is going on. So if you're not a technologist, you should be worried about it, uh, about algorithms that are being used, algorithms that are being treated as expert witnesses without being questioned, algorithms whose their designer is saying it's a master algorithm, it will work on, on anyone. Um, and especially in the current era where we are not held accountable, the technologists are not uh, held accountable, um, I see that that's a big problem. And so a push should be um, to come up either with regulations that have teeth or um, laws that have teeth um, that actually hold the technologists accountable. And if that means we need to have liability insurance, then so be it. Uh, then we need to have liability insurance. So on that note, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. All right. Uh, so it looks like one of the first questions that came in was from a little bit ago, but it was in uh, the uh, Rawls network. Um, how is talent defined? Uh, CES seems to be quantitative measure, but I'm unsure of the concept of talent. Yeah, so excellent point. Uh, you got to the nub of it. So talent has to be defined by the domain expert, right? We as computer scientists, we as technologists, it's not that I'm saying, oh, you know, I'm defining talent, but oftentimes in a um, in a uh, domain of expertise, they know what talent is. Now, I understand that talent is also linked to all the other issues that we have in our society, right? So, if I'm coming from a high socioeconomic status, perhaps my parents can pay for me to get tutors, and that will increase my talent, right? Versus if I have to uh, if I have to uh, work three jobs. Uh, and then like get prepared for a particular test to show that I'm talented. Uh, but that is one of the things where talent has to be 
um, designed with folks who know society, who know the domain area with ethicists. Uh, it is not that there's a magic bullet for what talent is. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, and the next is more of kind of, I think it, it's a more of a broader question, uh, which is uh, one way to handle such subjective topics might be to explain uh, to the decision maker what were assumptions made by the model. Uh, and basically was unsure if that can be uh, computationally done, um, but wanted to kind of hear your thoughts on, on that. Yeah, so that is an excellent comment. Uh, and there's a lot of work that's currently being done on explainability and interpretability. So uh, whether, for example, you need to crack open the machine learning model and actually have a causal explanation that you can tell to the human decision maker, or whether I just need to tell you some reasoning in terms of, oh, the algorithm said this because of that. Like if I change Tina's hair from black to blonde, the algorithm would give me some other um, 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 some other outcome. Uh, but there are people who are working both on on explainable AI, explainable artificial intelligence, and also, especially since um, deep learning and deep networks, these big, huge models that have uh, at least at this point, like some of these big language models that Google is working on, have like trillions of parameters. It's very difficult to crack open that model. And so try to just explain, okay, the outcome is this because the input was that. And to try to um, basically narrow down what are some of the parameters uh, and what are some of the features that are making the algorithm say a particular output. And that is an extremely hard um, area um, to, uh, to, to study. But people are studying them and they're slowly making a headway there. Great. Uh, the next question that we have is, uh, if we are to make ML designers accountable at this stage, how will the technology improve to reach a reliable state for the society? Uh, maybe ML uh, technology should be used to assist in decision making at this stage, uh, but not used for making conclusive decisions based on it. So actually, um, so that's an excellent point and, and question. So right now, for example, the algorithms that are being used in criminal justice, right, they're not replacing the judges. Right, but the judge is taking it into account. So should the judge be held accountable if the algorithm is biased against people of color? Or should the algorithm designer be held accountable? Right. And so and all of that is being sorted out as, as I speak to you now, right? And it takes a long time for those kinds of things to get sorted out. But it is not the case that an algorithm just by itself right now decides whether, for example, Tina gets bail or not, um, right? Um, but like Tina as a technologist, as a machine learning person is just flabbergasted that a judge can use a number from an algorithm to throw out a plea deal that human lawyers have come up with, right? And so um, just um, even putting a little bit of doubt in the human decision maker that look, this is not, uh, the, the algorithm is not omniscient Right, because there's this notion that the algorithm is somehow more objective um, than the human being. And in fact, this goes back to Caesar Hidalgo's work of, you know, humans don't uh, attach intentions to machines. Um, but of course, the machine is designed by a human that has intentions. Um, so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tough, uh, it's a sticky point. But that's where, for example, policymakers and lawyers need to get together because harm is being done, right? So that African-American gentleman that was arrested in Detroit in front of his family because of facial recognition technology mistook him for another person, right? Um, he's getting um, damages, uh, rightly so, from, uh, from the city, right? And so, um, so, so but, but these kinds of issues need to really be, um, be solidified because harm is being done. Uh, when when these algorithms are being used, um, so. I think the next question is kind of rolls into that, which is: Is there anything being done about adding warning labels to programs such as the uh, Northfield software? Yeah. So it was. Uh, yeah. So it was the company Northpoint that later on sold that. So 
Um, there was uh, some work um, done by uh, the folks that had uh, Google's ethical AI that has now been dismantled because uh, they were doing their job well and they got fired for it. <laughs> so they had these two nice papers. One was data sheets for data sets and model cards for model reporting, where you would have to, as a model designer, have to say what was the intentions for you making this model, what was it trained on, have results on the different demographics. Um, the same with the data sets, like how was it collected, um, so on and so forth. So for example, a, a case in terms of data sets, um, after Google found out that their image recognition wasn't doing very well on dark people, uh, of, of people of dark skin, um, they decided to hire the subcontractor to go get more pictures of darker skinned folks. Um, that subcontractor goes to Atlanta looks for um, uh, African-American students and African-American homeless people, and then gives each of them $5, have them sign consent forms, and then takes their picture. So now the image recognition system thinks that African-Americans are either homeless men or young college students, which is obviously crazy, right? And so, um, there are lots of these issues. And so, for example, for the data sheets for data sets, they were talking about that you need to say how the data was collected, how are you maintaining it, for what purposes it was collected. But it's going to be difficult to get those things to be used unless they're, um, uh, unless regulation with teeth is out there, that you need to use these kinds of things. And in particular in America, since we're very litigious, I think that we would have to have like lawsuits with uh, lots of dollars <laughs> behind it. For these things to change and in fact among all the different um organizations within, within the government fda is further along on this because obviously machine learning algorithms are being used in medical devices and in medicine and they they are trying to develop this um, good machine learning practices um so so more to come on that Okay, uh, the next uh, one on it is, could you expand a bit on the accountability aspect for the alg algorithms? Yeah, so let's say an algorithm is being used on you and uh, you get denied a loan because an algorithm was being used. Uh, what is the recourse for you, right? So you couldn't get that loan, you couldn't get that, that surgery uh, for your cancer and it gets worse, right? or um, you know, the facial recognition technology that mistook um, that African-American gentleman for another person. Um, so uh, there's a lot of auditing that is going on. So for example, my colleague, Crystal Wilson at Curry College has done really good work on auditing of algorithms that are being used uh, in Uber and in hiring and et cetera. Also Alan Mislov, who's another colleague um, has been doing a lot of auditing. Uh, and what is happening with auditing is that um, it's basically shaming these companies, but nothing more. So it's just bad PR for them, right? And bad PR is bad, of course, <laughs> but maybe it's not as bad as losing millions of dollars or billions of dollars. Um, but it's a very thriving area in terms of auditing algorithms that are being used. Great. Uh, so the next question uh, can, uh, that came to me was on what do you see as kind of the future and the next steps uh, that are going to be being taken in, in this field? So I feel like the, uh, so there are different aspects of it, right? So the most important aspect from my perspective is educating the public that this is happening and this could be happening on you, <laughs> right? And so you need to worry about it. Uh, and also educating the technologist about the culture aspect that just because you can do it, you shouldn't do it, right? Um, so for example, uh, you may not care about uh, fake news, right? And perhaps you are developing some of those algorithms that are enabling fake news to spread. Um, but perhaps because of that, less people get vaccinated and harm is caused to you or one of your loved ones who, for example, right now cannot get the vaccine because your loved one is under 12, right? And in a way it's by your own hand, but indirectly, right? Because you're helping these people, right? Develop this kind of technology. And so I think um, it has to be that 
you have to be aware of what is happening. You have to tell your friends what's, uh, what's happening. And we need to have a push in terms of, as a society, um, when should we use algorithms and when should we give our autonomy or agency to algorithms, which it seems like it's happening more and more, which is just, to me, it's crazy that you would want to give your agency or your autonomy to an algorithm, right? And there's been lots of cases in terms of, for example, I guess one of the things way back when, which, which diverted nuclear war between uh, America and Russia was that the system was saying that, that America launched a nuclear weapon to the former Soviet Union, but the guy did not believe it. The guy did not believe the system, right? And, and so he didn't press the button where they, then they would send us, uh, send their nuclear weapons and, uh, and, and fire them at us, right? And so this notion of being suspicious <laughs> about the, these, these algorithms is a first stop of, uh, and learning about them and then being suspicious. The more you learn, the more suspicious you will get of them, believe me. Great. Uh, the next question we have is, uh, do ML systems typically incorporate a backtree function to determine how did you arrive at this result? And how do designers unwind the, uh, and, and inspect the, this process? Often not. So one of the things that they care about a lot, especially on the, on the deep learning aspect of things, where you have these models that which have billions or trillions of, of parameters. Like one of the candidates that we were interviewing for a, a, a Curry uh, assistant professor this year was telling me that uh, he, he works in deep learning that for each paper, he needs $10,000 worth of computation to, to do the work, right? So if you have that many parameters, it's very difficult to figure out which ones or which sets or whatever, which multi-sets have, have an impact. So for them, what is important is that you have robust prediction. So for a given input, you have the same output, right? Uh, and in fact, this is uh, where a lot of uh, recent work on what's called adversarial machine learning has come about where, especially with the uh, automated vehicles, right? If I add just a few pixels to a stop sign image, perhaps the car will not see it as a stop sign image and it won't stop and somebody will get harmed. And this is a serious thing. Like there's lots of really cool examples of, for example, there's a panda and a picture of a panda and the machine learning algorithm is very confident that it's a panda and you just change one pixel and now with very, a lot of confidence, it says that it's a given, right? Uh, and there are lots of other examples also in text where, for example, for a particular review, let's say of a movie or restaurant, I can go and change the words with their synonyms. And let's say my review was positive and I change it with the synonyms. And now the machine learning algorithm says that the review is negative, but a human being would still say, no, that review was positive. And so there's lots of these things that are happening. And usually what the machine learning people who are using these big, big models say is that all I care about is robust prediction, that if you alter the input slightly, the output doesn't change, right? And then I would add some post hoc analysis of the output to, to make you, uh, you know, happy about why that output happened, right? Which is very different than like actually opening, like for example, with a Bayesian network, I can actually show you what is going on, right? Now, of course, if Bayesian networks can get very big and that would be more difficult as well. Um, but this is an early area of research that is happening in terms of understanding these things from the, you could originally just pick a model that's more interpretable, right? And that's what also people have been doing. Um, such as, for example, a small Bayesian network. So, yeah. All right. Um, I th the next question we have is, is it realistic to think education can overcome capitalism and VC-based economy of tech? I don't know, but I would like, I guess maybe as a professor, I just would like to have a more educated population, right? I think a more educated population can then think about what kind of society they want to live in. Right, so like one of the courses that I have been teaching and I would like to make it a permanent course is uh, in English, no symbols, tell incoming freshmen um, what the algorithms that they use in these apps are doing, right? Uh, and, and it's called Algorithms That Affect Lives. And I've taught it twice now to incoming freshmen in the honors program and it's great. And especially, for example, some of the aspects of hiring, right? So if I'm using an automated tool 
to, uh, to analyze hiring, then perhaps it's not going to be that forgiving on people who have accents. Is that okay? You know, so there's lots of different issues that come about. Or for example, these, um, the ads, the, the, uh, the targeted ads, um, I can detect if you are bipolar and I can detect if you're going manic. Should I push you ads that promote your risky behavior? Right now we have no laws about it. I can push you risky ads that I know since because of your mental state, you're likely to press and do bad things for yourself and your family. Right, because you're manic, you go to, I don't know, Vegas, you spend all your money, right? Should I do that? If, if my goal is just engagement, making money for myself and my company, then I would do that. But I feel like if, if we have a more educated population, then perhaps they will say no, right? Um, this is not okay. I don't want this in my society. All right, I think we have time for one last question. Um, the one that we have here is uh, what a process of placing a, a fiduciary like duty or obligation on these algorithms or the engineers who construct these algorithms lead to a more equitable system. Uh, is there anything like this being worked on currently? I don't know of anything that's being worked on this. I think anything that will make the algorithm designers think twice about the uses of, uh, of their tool is a good thing. Uh, and so, but since right now, a lot of, for example, um, the apps that we currently use, or also for this, for the, for the high stakes decisions, they're more about engagement or somehow this algorithm is more accurate. Um, all of this discussion of maybe I should hold somebody accountable, or maybe they should have some other um, constraints on them is it, not being talked about. Um, which I think it should be talked about, right? <laughs> so accountability is important. We need to think about it. All right, uh, Nick, go ahead. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today for what was a fantastic event. Thank you, Professor, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to uh, lead this excellent discussion. Uh, for everyone else, I would like to direct you to alumni.northeastern.edu to uh, check out future events. Please get involved. You can always contact Matt if you have any questions. And thank you again, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. Take and care, just everyone. for everyone's uh, knowledge, uh, this will be up on our YouTube channel probably early uh, next week if you missed it. Um, and if you need to contact me, um, I'm at the alumni office. So my email is just m.lucerto, that's L-U-C-E-R-T-O at northeastern.edu and happy to connect with anyone. Uh, and feel free to look at the survey that comes out. Uh, always hear, it's great to hear from our alums to kind of see how our, our events go so we can plan other great events like this. So thank you everyone. And again, thank you uh, to the professor for a very uh, great conversation. Thank you. And I just saw Nick said, yes, I, I, I misspoke. I meant dark skinned people, right? People of color, for example. Uh, it was just, uh, um, I, I, I spoke incorrectly at that point. So just for, for clarification's sake. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Great. Thank you.